Hey everybody, Teching here. Um, hope you enjoyed the Six Nights of Horroween that wrapped up yesterday, along with Halloween itself. So let's all let's all shed a collective tear for All Hallows Eve. The best time of the year has passed once again, but hey, it's time to move on to the month of November. I have a lot of stuff planned. Um, little bit of an issue though. I got to spring on you all right out of the gate. I'm really sorry about this, but. When it comes to this video right here, you actually have to have a prerequisite in order to watch. You know how some YouTubers are like, in order to watch this video, you need to first go to this other channel or, you know, website or something. Um, I'm sorry to say this, but before you watch this video, you need to have a mustache. Yeah, so obviously I'm set. And uh, I understand some of my fans probably have very epic facial hair, I'm sure. But uh, for those of you that don't, you got to either glue a piece of uh, foam or get some printer paper and cut out something or even just like a sticky note. You got to have something on your upper lip or else this just isn't going to work. All right. We all good? I'm trusting you all now. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming everybody watching this has a mustache. All right. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about... Uh, uh, that actually lasted a little longer than I thought it would. Um, hold on a second. Okay, new rule. I am personally exempt from the mustache clause, but everybody else watching this better have some epic facial hair. Okay, today's video is going to be about the 16 division commanders of the Whitebeard crew. Ah, yes, 16 hearty, beefy men, some of which are dead, that lead up the world's strongest pirate crew. At least they used to until it was disbanded. But that doesn't mean we're not going to see the Division Commanders ever again. Um, I'm sure like Marco, Jozu, Vista, we're going to see those guys again. But the ones that we didn't really get to see all that much of in Marineford, like I would personally like it if we got to see all of them again, you know, maybe flesh out their backstories a bit. But uh, I'm okay if Oda doesn't do that because it's been pretty much established when Marco was explaining this to Nekamamushi after the payback war, after they tried to take out Blackbeard and they failed. Much of the crew just got scattered to the four seas and the Grand Line. I'm sure some of them might come back, um, but there might be some of them that are like, you know what, I'm done with the pirate game. I was part of the world's strongest crew and we still, all, all the failures that we had, you know, Pops is dead, A is dead. We tried to get revenge on Blackbeard. That failed. You know what? I'm just going to hang up my, my bicorn hat and just be a normal civilian. It's possible. But then again, it's also possible that they could get the band back together at some point. You know, I could see this. I could see, you know, Marco was talking to Neko Mamushi about, you know, hey, you should come to Wano and help us out. And Marco b chose to stay on Whitebeard's home island. But hey, maybe after a little while, maybe Marco would be like, because Marco stayed to protect against Weevil. So, hey, maybe Weevil does attack and maybe Marco saves the island or he calls his friends, you know, hey, commanders, get over here. We're going to protect Pops' home island. And then maybe they fight back against Weevil or something. And then after that, they decide, you know what, let's just let's let's do it. Let's get the crew back together and let's go help out the Straw Hats and Ace's brother as much as we can. It might happen. Who knows? All right. So as you could probably figure, we don't know that much about all 16 commanders. Uh, the ones that we know the most about, Marco, Ace, obviously, Jozu, Thatcher little bit vista um other than that though not really all that much we do all know all their names uh because oda came out in an sbs and this is something that oda does quite a bit uh, when he introduces a large quantity of characters at once marine ford was definitely one of those we got a bunch of new marines introduced all the new characters we just got introduced to an impel down like ivankov and inazuma plus all the division commanders of the whitebeard crew Oda will come out and he'll like, you know, write out notes, like all the characters' names and their concept art and their backstories. I'm sure he has like just a general idea of like, oh yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Curiel, like yeah, he's the 10th division commander. This is his basic backstory, just something in his head. He doesn't reveal all this information though in the series. Uh, for one thing, I think it's just because there's not enough time. Marineford was a straight up war. You know, you got two sides going at each other. There's not enough time to be like, you know, Izo is in the middle of battle and, and all of a sudden we freeze frame we go back into his backstory and then atmos is charging and then we find out his bag like, there's not enough time for that crap okay so it's better that oda just you know here's their names here are their divisions that they head up but i don't have like i have a basic idea what they're all about but i don't have time to explain that to everybody and one piece the manga is just it's constantly going and changing and evolving so i i don't think oda is like gonna shoehorn in things that he doesn't feel it's going to fit you know like all right here's all of the division commanders at marine ford 
you're not going to know most about them there because they're in the middle of a battle. But hey, who knows? Maybe someday later on down the line, they'll be in a, a place and a time where I can expand on their backstories. Um, and then a, a perfect example of this is Big Mom and all of her children of the Charlotte family. You know, 80 plus kids... Oda came up with concept art and names for every single one of them, the islands that they're ministers of, what their devil fruit abilities are, if they have any. Some are twins, some are triplets, some are quadruplets, some are decuplets. He has all that stuff written down. It's just like, yeah, I didn't have the time to, you know, show it off in the manga. There's not enough time for this crap. So, okay, he has a lot of supplemental material. And I would I would hope that he has, like, a giant compendium, and then after One Piece is over, he just releases, like, here's the One Piece Index. <laughs> Oh, man, it's as fat as, like, ten phone books. And it's like, here's all my notes. <laughs> okay, here you go. I would buy that shit in a heartbeat, bro. I don't care. It's like, this is the ultimate One Piece compendium. It's $500. I'm like, I don't care. I'm buying it. I need to know everything, you know? Right, so like most Yonko crews, uh, Whitebeard's crew was pretty large uh, compared to your average pirate crew. Not quite as large as, like, a Yonko like Big Mom or Kaido. Big Mom had, like, an entire country under her reign. Uh, Kaido basically does as well, except... I think that Totland is probably bigger than Wano just because all the different islands that make it up and everything like that was a straight-up country that she ruled over Kaido kind of rules over a country too but he has to split it with like a Rochi and everything and but suffice it to say he has enough members of his crew the Beast Pirates that can cover all you know the corners of Wano so he has a pretty large crew as well um Whitebeards is not as large as that I would say a few hundred men make up his crew maybe a thousand maximum um he has 16 divisions and then 16 commanders that head up said divisions and then there's some other people on his crew like the nurses he has nurses that attend to him that are all like sexy you know super attractive nurses that are like oh wipe your time to take your medicine so you know he also has a dog named stefan who is adorable he has a mustache as well um never seen a dog with a mustache but i have now um so yeah, that, that makes up Whitebeard's crew. The lone exception to this uh, large Yonko crew, crew role, and, um, and, and even Blackbeard, because Blackbeard as well is pretty much like the opposite of Whitebeard, but he still has divisions, so he's kind of like ripping off Whitebeard there, kind of mocking him maybe. Uh, but the lone exception to this is Shanks. Shanks' is, like, crew, he has like one ship, and it's like, I can't think of more than 100 men on his crew. Uh, probably only a few dozen, but that's all he needs, you know? That's the thing about, that's the thing about Shanks. So, yeah, um... Um, now, I like to think that each of the individual divisions on Whitebeard's crew, uh, also Whitebeard, keep in mind, I think he has like four ships under his command. He has the flagship, the Moby Dick, but I think there were like three other ships. There was the paddle ship we also got to see during Marine Four. but there's other, there's other vessels he has. There's other vessels. So, I like to think each division has a different job on the crew. And a good way for you to look at this is just, let's take a look at the first division right off the bat. The first division commander is Marco, and Marco was actually the ship's doctor as well. Or at least I like to think of the head doctor. Because on a crew as large as a Yonko, you know, you one doctor's not going to be good enough, you know? Like, it works for the straw hats, and like, you know, because there's only like 10 of them, you know? Well, come on, Jinbei, come on, there's 10 of them, come on, Jinbei, get up there. But, you know, there's not a very large crew, so Chopper can take care of, you know, whenever there's somebody having a belly ache or get shot in the arm or something like that um but imagine a crew as large as like a thousand men chopper would be run ragged he's running all over the place like oh my god there's so many things i need to do so i like to think like the first division all of the divisions are capable of fighting they're all trained in the art of being pirates and all that crap so they're all capable of fighting but the first division in particular that's the division that's head up by the ship's main doctor marco so i would like to think there's a lot of other doctors and maybe even like the nurses that we got to see um, that were tending to wipe her. They were also part of the first division in, in a way. Like, that's where they were going to be put, okay? So there was other doctors there, like, hey, um, I'm a pirate, but I also have an interest in, you know, medical knowledge. And it's like, oh, well, join the first division. Marco will help you out. And the thing is about the Whitebeard crew is that they treated each other like family. And Whitebeard was their father. So, not just figuratively, but they, like, all genuinely felt like they were misfits of the world and, like, you know, Whitebeard's going to be our dad. So I can see that they all acted like siblings in that sense. I'm sure they bickered every once in a while, and maybe there's like one like, oh yeah, the the 6th division and the 13th division, they don't get along. You know, maybe there's something like that, you know, you know, banter like sibling rivalry between the, the divisions and stuff. Um, you know, just like on a crew of that size, you're going to have people you like and you don't like, but all together they they come they come as one as a family to improve. Okay, so I can see it like that. All right. So Marco, I've made some videos about him. I talked
talked about him in the Mythical Zone video. I did a video about what I called the Marco Pirates, you know, him basically trying to get the crew back together. I talked about Marco. He's the owner of the Mythical Zone fruit, so he has the ability to turn into a phoenix. We don't exactly know the name of the phoenix fruit yet. It could just be like the um, Tori Tori no me model phoenix, wouldn't it be? Yeah, Tori means bird, right? So yeah, that would probably be like what it is. And because he has the ability of the phoenix, he has access to the flames of resurrection or the flames of revival. So if he ever gets hit directly, and it could just be like he could seriously just get stabbed or shot, the flames literally just heal immediately. He's still technically getting hurt when someone, you know, slices him and he cuts off his wing. He still technically lost it, but it heals so fast, it doesn't even really, re really register with him. Um, he's also capable of using the flames of revival on other people um, to kind of speed up their healing faculties, but it's not like a cure-all. It's not like an immediate thing. Like if somebody loses an arm, Marco can't run up to you and just, you know, tap you on the arm and just... Oh, well, thanks, Marco. You know, um, in that situation, he would probably be able to cauterize the wound and close it up rather fast. He could probably do something like that. And on top of it, he also has basic medical knowledge. So he doesn't just rely on his devil fruit. He also has, you know, basic medical knowledge, how to dress a wound and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the first division there. And also keep in mind, for many of these divisions, the only person that we like, the only named character that we know that is from said division is the division commander. Um, actually, I think the lone exception to this is the next division, the second one, headed up by Porcus D. Ace, who was unfortunately no longer with us. But in the second division led by Ace, we knew that Blackbeard was part of that. Okay, and Blackbeard was apparently a member of Whitebeard's crew for a very, very long time. I think ever since he was like 16 years old or some such. And um, the second division commander slot was vacant for a long time. This is something else to bring up. Like, they have division commanders, but I don't think it gets taken like super, super seriously. Like, you know, if, if like in Bleach, for instance, like if there's a captain of the Gote 13 that dies in action, that's a big deal. And they're going to try to like, oh, we got to try to like fill that position because that's like a lack of leadership leadership or something um but in this situation here i don't think it's that big of a problem you know like oh the second division commander it's it's, it's the spot is vacant after the last guy died like five years ago be like oh okay well does anyone want to take it Mm, not really. Like, oh, okay. Well, we'll continue on. Because, yeah, they're a division, but they're not completely independent. They're all part of the Whitebeard crew, so it's not like when they go into battle, it's not like, all right, second division, you guys have fun fighting. We're going to be over here playing cards. Tell us when it's done. Tell us when the fight's over. You know, um, it's nothing like that. They all fight as a unit. It's just this is an easier way to probably, like, you know, honestly, probably just to separate the jobs in the crew. You know, like the first division is responsible for medical treatment and stuff of that nature. So yeah, Blackbeard was a part of the second division, but his whole goal was just to lay low. He wanted to lay low until he could eventually stumble upon the Yami Yami no Mi, and then he could take that. So he wasn't trying to stand out. He wasn't trying to become a division commander or anything like that. Um, ev eventually, when Ace joined up, when he was pretty much beaten down and then just thrown on the ship, you know, and his entire crew was assimilated into it, um, they offered him the position. He's like, hey, Ace, why not be the second division commander? Spot's been open forever now, and no one really minds, so you, you, you're strong, you should take it. So yeah, uh, Ace became 2nd Division Commander after Blackbeard killed Thatch, who was the 4th Division Commander and a good friend to Ace. Um, he decided to set out to try to find him, and we all know what happened with that. Uh, Black he did end up finding Blackbeard, Blackbeard took him out, and he eventually got killed at Marine Ford by Akainu. So the 2nd Division was left vacant once again. Now, I don't know what Ace's division would have exactly been like, because Ace was a relatively new commander, um, but, you know, considering that the Spade Pirates were assimilated into the Whitebeard crew, I'm assuming they all joined up with the 2nd Division, so they could still follow their captain. Uh, Ace is somebody that has really good table manners, you know, opposite of Luffy, so he's probably like, okay, men, when you finish clearing your plates, make sure to put it into the kitchen, and don't leave your silverware out, and make sure to throw away your trash on the 5th of every month, you know, that kind of stuff. He's just like, let's Let's run a tight ship, ladies and gents, but Ace is a pretty chilled, laid-back kind of guy, so yeah, I'm sure being part of his division was pretty cool, right? Alright, so now we get into uh, the third division, headed up by Diamond Jozu. Alright, so Jozu has the power of a Paramecia, we don't know the name of his fruit either, but uh, it doesn't allow him to turn his entire body into diamond, it allows him just to, like, coat his body with diamond and stuff, so that, that's why it's a Paramecia. So, uh, yeah, now his rule, I would assume, is the van guard all right he's like all right men we're gonna be the first ones to charge in because he's made a diamond so i would 
imagine that's what he would do. Uh, either that, or I could also see him as, like, the bodyguards of Whitebeard. Not that Whitebeard needs a bodyguard, but, like, personal protection, because that's what Jozu did during the war. You know, Mihawk launched the strongest slash in the world, um, Jozu jumped in and blocked it. Okay, now, I think all of them, all of the division commanders are gonna protect Pops as much as possible. Like, he doesn't, like, yeah, he's strong enough to defend himself, no one's saying that, but it's like, it's kind of like, you don't even need to bother yourself, Pops, with these pissants. We got it. You know, it was like that during Marine Ford. I think Kizaru tried to attack him once, and then Marco stepped in and blocked Kizaru, and then they went off to fight, and then Mihawk tried to attack him, and Ace is the second division commander, but he's indisposed at the moment, so the responsibility fell on the third division commander, Jozu, to protect Whitebeard, and then that's how you go about it. Um, but yeah, I could see his crew as, like, the ones that charge into battle first, you know, to thin out the herd, you know, just bulldoze through all of them with Jozu being a freaking diamond man, all right? So pretty damn, pretty damn cool character. Jozu actually lost an arm. <laughs> uh, Aokiji froze him solid and his arm fell off, and we see him later on at Whitebeard's funeral. He's missing it. So yeah, next time we see Jozu, he's going to be out of an arm. But hey, just the, uh, just the ability to turn into diamond is pretty damn impressive. Now, he can be injured. We saw that with Aokiji, but at the end of the day, all swords and gunfire are pretty much going to have no no effect on him. So I would love to see Jozu again if we saw any of the commanders come back. Jozu and Vista are, I think, the ones that I really want to see again. But uh, moving on to the 4th Division commander, Thatch. And um, I, you know what? I think I'm actually going to let Thatch himself explain his duties to you all, okay? Take it away, Thatch. That was beautiful. I have never heard a more heartfelt way of explaining your duties and how much you respect the crew as a whole. Way to go, Thatch. All right, so the 5th Division Commander... All right, I'll right, we'll talk about Thatch a little bit. Thatch is somebody we really know nothing about um, because he was killed off-screen by uh, Blackbeard before the start of the series even happened. Uh, yeah, so Thatch was the 4th Division Commander. He's the one that stumbled across the Yami Yami no Mi. Blackbeard saw that, and he was like... I've been on this crew for like 30, 40 years, however long I've been on this crew. I lost track of the years, but it's finally in front of me. So Blackbeard kills Thatch, uh, basically stabs him in the back at night when he wasn't looking, and uh, takes the Yami Yami no Mi for himself and then leaves the crew, and then, you know, uh, Ace has to go out and try to find him. So I, I, th I believe we find out a little bit more about Thatch in the, you know, Ace light novels. In fact... I don't know if this is just the way he dresses is why I'm thinking this, but I think I might have read somewhere that Thatch is the cook. Because he looks like a chef, doesn't he? That very, like, high-class way he's dressing, you know, with the outfit and the scarf and everything. Looks like a chef to me. So, I don't know if that's something like Mandela effect. I'm just thinking that I might have read it in there in the light novel recap, or if this just going by the way he dresses. But, okay, let's go with that. I'm gonna, there had to be you know, a division on the crew that was in charge of cooking. So, let's, ro let's roll with that. Alright, so, uh, let's say Thatch is the head chef, and the fourth division is mostly made up of cooks. And then they keep the crew fed and hearty. Um, Thatch himself uh, seems to use a sword in combat. He had one on his hip, but don't really know how much he, you know, how well versed he was at using it. Uh, has a scar on the right side of his eye that actually looks a lot like Garp's scar. It's like a crescent moon that, like, you know, circles right around the perimeter of his eye. Um, and he seemed like a really cool dude. Had an epic pompadour. Um, he was friends with Ace, um, you know, but unfortunately he was capped off by uh, Blackbeard and everybody gets pissed off by this. Not just because, you know, it was Thatch that got killed. He was a nice guy, but just that's part of the pirate code. You never kill your own, you know. That's, like, that's a big no-no. And so that's why Ace head out out to, you know, avenge Thatch's death. Partly because he was a friend, but also because of just, like, the pirate code in general. We can't have this stuff, you know, taken taken lightly. So, yeah, that was Thatch. Rest in peace. Uh, moving on to the 5th Division Commander, Flower Sword Vista, who is easily the most talented swordsman out of the entire uh, group. Um, you know, not every, a lot of members of the Whitebeard crew use some type of bladed weapon. Like, Whitebeard himself uses a Bicento. Um, Speed Jiro uses a Lance. But when it comes to just straight-up sword fighting, that's Vista. Vista's territory, and everybody kind of knows his name, he's really well known, uh, he clashed with Mihawk at Marine Ford. he was able to hold his own against Mihawk, and Mihawk knew who he was, and Mihawk was not like, uh, 
you're such a pitiful swordsman. No, Mihawk took him very seriously. They clash blades there, and Mihawk was just like, I mean, uh, Vista was just like, ah, Mihawk, every swordsman worth his salt yearns to cross blades with him. They could contend with one another, and just because Mihawk is the strongest swordsman in the world, contending with him in any capacity... That's pretty impressive. Um, I like to think that, yeah, there's a lot of members of the crew that aren't part of the 5th Division that use swords. You know, a, you know, a sword is just such an easy weapon, you know, just like, oh, it's a sharp thing I poke people with. There you go. Um, most of the crew uses, you know, swords and guns. That's that's their prime stuff there. Uh, but I can imagine that if there is a swordsman in the crew that wants to be, like, a really, really good swordsman, like, not just, like, I use a cutlass in battle. No, someone that really wants to take the art of swordsmanship seriously and, like, I am going to train as much as possible, learn all these different really complicated swordsmanship techniques and everything, then you go to Vista, and you be part of the 5th Division, and he'll train you up something good. I can imagine that he has, like, you know, all right, men, it's time for our Saturday morning training session for swords, you know, like, something like that. I, maybe it's, like, kind of like the Gote 13, where, like, all of the division commanders, like, head up, like, a special club or something. You know, like, every Thursday afternoon, that's the time that Thatch teaches the crew how to bake a cake. Every Friday evening is when Marco is like, all right, men, today we're going to learn how to dress a wound. And then every, like, Saturday morning, that's when Vista, like, all right, men, it's time to learn the swordsmanship. Today we'll be learning kendo. You know, like, that that, that kind of stuff. You know, that would be probably really cool. And they're all part of the big family, so I can see them doing that, right? Okay. That, that would be something. What would each of the commanders do if they could head up, like, a club, like, in high school? Like, what would it be, you know? Um... Yeah, Vista's pretty badass. I mean, and he has an epic stash as well. It's not white, but it is epic. He's like a very, like a Three Musketeers, like, I am D'Artagnan kind of shit. Uh, really cool. Every time he swings his swords, the name, the, the reason he got his epithet is every time he swings his sword, like flower petals, like rose petals just appear out of nowhere. I don't think it's because of a devil fruit or anything. I just think it's because he's so talented, you know, or maybe he just keeps flower petals in his pockets. He's like, ha ha, today you cross swords with flower sword vista. <laughs> he swings his sword so fast and nobody notices him reaching into his pocket and like throwing out a bunch of flower petals. Or, or maybe he has other members of his division that stay around him at all times. Like, wait for it. Wait for it. He's going to do it. Ha-ha! Now, man, now! And then, like, I'll throw the flower petals into the air. Hey, that could work to distract the enemy. I mean, take every advantage you can get, right? But Vista's pretty cool. Also, side note with Vista, he actually has a grudge with Yasop from the Red Hair crew. I don't know what the grudge, I don't know what the nature of it is, but you see them kind of giving each other the stink eye there at Marineford in the background. See, that's the stuff I love about Oda. In his notes, when he was coming up with designs for everybody, obviously, you know, Vista's a member of the Yonko. Oh, well, no, no, Vista's not a member of the Yonko, but he's part of the Yonko crew, and so is Yasop. He's part of the Yonko crew, so they've probably run into each other at some point, and Oda probably wrote down a note, like, you know, Vista and Yasop, you know, something happened to them in their past, and they're just, you know, it, it, it helps you feel like they're more like characters, like actual people, you know? So, yeah, we don't know the nature of that. Maybe we'll find out about it. Maybe we won't. But I, it's especially awesome when the fans notice this kind of stuff. Because you know Oda just gets giddy with it. You know, like someone sends him an SBS like, Hey, Oda Sensei, I was rereading Marineford and I saw this one panel where Yasop and Vista were like glaring at each other. Like, what's up with that? Oda's like, oh my god, they noticed? Okay, well, since you asked, <laughs> you know, like, there you go. And he doesn't give the whole story, because that would take away the mystery, but yeah. Alright, so, um, those are the, f the five division commanders that we really know a lot about, that we focused on primarily. Um... You could say that because they're the top five, they're the strongest. Um, the ones that have, like, access to Devil Fruits, like Marco, Ace, Jozu, they all had Devil Fruit abilities. Um, with Thatch probably did not because he found the Yami Yami Nomi. That would be a, that'd be an interesting what-if scenario. What if Thatch did end up eating the Yami Yami Nomi? The thing is, though, we don't know much about Thatch to begin with, so I don't really know if I could make a whole video about that, but it's me, so I probably could. And Vista... I mean, maybe he has some sort of flower fruit, or maybe it's just to look cool, but I like to think he doesn't. He's just a really badass swordsman there. Um, but yeah, I would say the top five commanders are 
definitely the strongest if we're going to just like say it all right uh but that doesn't mean the other commanders don't have devil fruits or access to a devil fruit related ability you'll understand what i mean by that when we get to the seventh division commander because he himself doesn't have a devil fruit but he has a weapon that does so that that'll make sense they all have so some of them have devil fruits i'm sure they all know hockey to an extent um it's just that the five are the ones that are like you know vista's a really good swordsman marco has a mythical zone jozu has this unbreakable diamond shield ace as a logia you can turn into a fire like those are the ones that you really don't mess with okay so moving on to the sixth division commander blamenko and Blamenko Blamenko has one of the more interesting designs out of all of the members of the crew. Uh, Blamenko is this, this huge guy, a big fat guy, that has blue overalls with a pink bear, like, cartoon stitched on him. Looks like something out of, like, uh, you know, Five Nights at Freddy's or something. He has a bicorn hat with the Whitebeard sigil on him. By the way, I should talk about that, too. The Whitebeard Pirates have, like, a few different variants of their flag. Uh, they have the main flag of the, of the ship, which is like this, you know, the, uh, you know, the skull and crossbones with the Whitebeard's, you know, uh, face on the skull and the, and the stash right there but they also have like another variation that they just like i, I think just because it's easier to draw on oda's part but you know like marco has this tattooed on his chest and a few others you know have it tattooed somewhere on their body you know to represent loyalty to pops so they have that so blamenko has a bicorn hat with that sigil on it there as well as uh he, he's missing some teeth as well which he's a pirate makes sense but he has these two weird pocket looking things on his chin on the left side and the right side of his chin and he actually uses those pockets to pull out weapons so during the war you know a bunch of marines were charging him he's like ah, come at it fatty and then blamenko just reaches into his chin pocket and pulls out like a giant wooden mallet like a giant mallet that's several times the size that he is he just picks up this mallet. he's like ah bam and just slaps them into the next county all right so obviously blamenko has the ability of of, I would say the pocket pocket fruit it's definitely a devil fruit right and I'm assuming that with this devil fruit ability the pocket pocket fruit um, he can make pockets anywhere on his body and he can pull and store anything that he wants in there um doesn't really seem to be that much of a limit considering the mallet was huge and I'm sure it was pretty heavy as well Blamenko's a pretty strong dude so he could pull that out no problem it's also a play on the uh, like old cartoons of a uh, hammer space and this is a thing, this is like a trope in really old school cartoons, like, you know, like Bugs Bunny is messing with Elmer Fudd, and then Bugs pulls out a giant hammer out of nowhere, just, like, Bugs just reaches behind his back, and he's like, hey, hey, what's up, Doc? And then just hits him over the head, or something like that. That's, I think, what Oda was making fun of there. He's literally f pulling a giant hammer out of, like, his pocket space. So, there you go. Um, I'm sure he has a, a slew of other weapons in there. So, I'm going to assume the 6th Division is responsible for the armory or the inventory of the, of the ships, so to speak. You know, because with Blamenko's ability, I'm sure he has pockets other, where, other places on his body. You know, maybe he just kept it on his face because that's, like, easy to reach into. Like, anytime he wants to, he could just, like, shoop, 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 shoop. You know, just the easiest place to just grab. It's not covered up with his clothes or anything like that. Um, but I'm sure he has pockets other places and his entire division is like okay men we're responsible for making sure we have enough weapons for the war so let's all go through how many swords how many spears how many you know cannons do we have you know that kind of stuff how many cannonballs our bullet count what's it at you know that's the kind of stuff I would imagine they would do all right so now moving on to the seventh division headed up by Rakuyo I love this dude all right just his design he looks like uh, someone that would be like in a heavy metal band in the 1970s you know so he has this the dreadlocks mustache combo and his main weapon is basically the chain chomp from super mario brothers okay so he has uh basically it would be like a morning star or like a flail but the the spike ball on the end of it is sentient and aware and it has a mouth and eyes and it can like chomp 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 all right so um there's been, I guess, a some debate. Some people have said maybe it's not a devil fruit, maybe it's just a mechanical thing, but no, no, no. I think this thing is very obviously animated by a devil fruit. It was a spike iron ball that ate a devil fruit. So just like how uh, Lasso was a gun that ate the dog fruit, just like how uh, Fung Freed was a sword that ate the elephant fruit, this was just a spiked ball flail morning star thing that consumed... Uh, 
the piranha piranha fruit i don't know some kind of animal that liked to bite things a lot that had really sharp teeth so to speak so uh rakuyo i'm assuming he, just like how spondum could get funk free to do whatever he wanted because you know he was you know he fed him and you know gave him a nice place to sleep at night probably the same thing with rakuyo rakuyo is like uh, in, in his in his barracks he's like all right there chompy just eat your food okay we're going to the war tomorrow so you know we better make sure that we get in a good night's sleep and we can fill our tummies tomorrow right and the, i can imagine the chain chomp is like maybe some sort of like dog it's like <laughs> okay sir okay master and uh, that's how they fight uh rakuyo uh he doesn't screw around he straight up tried to take out kizaru all right, so Kizaru had his back turned to him, and Rakuyo noticed this as a, oh, I'm going to get an attack of opportunity here, and he swings his freaking uh, spike ball around and just, Faw! takes a chomp right out of Kizaru, like his entire chest just gets clomped by this thing. Now, because Kizaru obviously is a Logia, and he can turn into light, it didn't really affect him at all, but still, that was really cool. Like, like yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be me, the 7th Division Commander Rakuyo. I'm gonna be the one to take out Kizaru. <laughs> you know, hey, at least he's trying. At least he's not just like, I better leave this to somebody a little stronger. You know, it's like, ah, oh, you gotta take a chance of opportunity. Hey, who knows? Maybe you'll get lucky. So it didn't work out too well. And then later on during the war, we can see him crying over the death of Ace. We see a lot of the members of the crew just, you know, crying and, you know, blubbering because Ace died and they couldn't save him. So that's not a thing with just Rakuyo. That's with a lot of members of the crew. But yeah, um, oh, 7th Division. I don't know. Well... We need musicians! <laughs> we all know about that from Luffy spouting on about it for most of the first half of One Piece. Like, we need to get a musician on the crew, and then they finally found Brooke. But, um, hey, every crew needs some, uh, needs some entertainment in some way or another, so I would imagine because Rakuyo is, he's looking like a 70s, you know, metal dude, so let's break out the guitar and like, yeah, guys! Maybe there's other members of the crew. In fact, I can think of another member that would also maybe be in charge of, like, an entertainment kind of thing for his division, but I can see Rakuyo you know, busting out the electric guitar, because electric guitars exist in One Piece. He could bust that out every now and then, you know, it's like, all right, guys, let's rock this place down, you know, okay. So, uh, moving on now to the 8th Division, headed up by Namor. Namor is interesting, because he is the only fishman that is a division commander in the Whitebeard crew, and... The thing about him is that you can kind of see where his backstory lies. Because Whitebeard was somebody that actually protected Fishman Island whenever the, pir the Great Pirate Era started and all the pirates were flooding into Fishman Island and kidnapping all the of the mermaids and just making life a living hell. That's when Whitebeard stepped in and slammed down his mighty Bicento and with a thunderous, booming voice, he was like, this island is my territory now. And then everyone's like, oh shit, okay, yeah, it's your territory now. Holy crap. I like to think that Namor was really inspired by Whitebeard at that moment. You know, he, maybe maybe it was like, um, maybe his wife, Namor's wife or somebody that he really cared about, maybe his child was taken by pirates. And then Whitebeard showed up and then put an end to that and he got his wife back. And Namor was like, you know what? Because Pop saved this island and he saved my family or someone I really loved... I'm going to in, in debt myself to him. I'm going to join up with his crew, and I'm going to do as much as I can to help him out. Could, can you see that? I could totally see that. And I could also see, because we don't get to see every member of every division. We, we get to see, like, random members of the crew running around just fighting. We don't get to see every member. Um, but I like to think that maybe a few other fishmen might have followed his lead. You know, so Namor is like, oh, that's Namor. He's the 8th Division commander of Whitebeard's crew. Other fishmen might be inspired by him and might be like, yeah, Whitebeard, man, he saved our island. Let's join up with him. I'll, I'm going to join up with the Whitebeard crew. I'll be part of your 8th Division, Namor. Let's do this. So, uh, yeah, I like to think that Namor, uh, because maybe a lot of people in his division are fishmen, or even if they're not fishmen, he can teach them fishman karate. Now, we don't see Namor using fishman karate. We just see him, he's some type of shark fishman. We don't know the exact type of shark he is, but he's clearly a shark. Uh, so he fights mostly just by running around, using his increased strength as a fishman, and just using his powerful jaws just to rip. Like, he could just take an axe and just, and just rip it. Like, mm. A little bit too brittle and just spits it out and then everyone's like oh, okay uh, I'm not gonna mess with you but you know I can imagine he would also know Fishman Karate to an extent so maybe that's what his division is part of you know teaching that very specific martial art to everybody that would join up okay so yeah that, that's Namor I like him if, if there's any other member of the crew like beyond the top five like I want to see Jozu and Vista again but 
I would really like to see Namor because he's so different. He's a fishman, and I'm sure his backstory was tied to Whitebeard saving Fishman Island and everything, and he might know Fishman Karate. And we know humans can learn it too because of Koala. So yeah, that's pretty cool for, for Namor there. Uh, also, I would like to think he could also be a navigator because, you know, fishmen have that ability to speak to fish and they can get directions. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I mean, it could be possible there. I mean, fishmen are pretty good at just navigating the sea just by inherently being able to speak to the to the sea life you know so yeah if they get lost they could just be like hey where's nearest island thanks man and just keep going thanks swordfish i owe you one later <laughs> so yeah so next up is the ninth division headed up by blenheim that's a good strong name that's like a viking name i don't know if it is but it sounds like one blenheim all right so blenheim looks like an old school biker okay that's what he looks like he's like the head of a biker gang or something he's got a, a torn denim vest with no sleeves he's got the white beard tats on both of his shoulders he's got this bushy you know gray beard and a you know long ponytail he's been a member of the white beard crew for a very long time i actually think we even get to see him during the strong world backstory when we cut back to like 24 years ago when Aunt roger was executed and we see Whitebeard and Sheiky hanging out. I think we also see Blenheim there, so he's been part of this crew for a very long time. Um, now, because Blenheim does look like a biker, I'm just gonna go and say, hey, let's make him and his division the shipwright division. All right, I can see him like he's working on bikes and stuff, so he works on repairing the ship and all that stuff. And like I said, I'm sure most of the crew will pitch in whenever it's like a big, you know, they, they just had a big fight, but uh, you know, we're all gonna you know piece the ships back together and repair them. But maybe Blenheim is like the head of all the shipwrights. They actually know what all the stuff they're doing and so if you you want to be a shipwright if you want to learn how to build stuff and fix it then you know come and join my division i'll help you out you know that kind of stuff so yeah that, that's blenheim not really much to say about him he was the one after jozu was taken out by aokiji after he was frozen solid and lost an arm blenheim was the one that like oh man all right man we got to get you out of here so he like ties a rope around him throws jozu over his shoulder which joe i mean blenheim is a big dude but jozu is even bigger and he can like made a diamond and everything and he's frozen solid which probably adds some weight on it so this giant block of ice pretty much but uh blenheim you know slings him over his shoulder like we're getting out of here you know and then th that's how they get away but yeah so just one of the bigger muscular men of uh whitebeard's crew all right now moving on to the 10th division and this is one of my favorites all right this is one of the ones just looking at his design I overlooked completely back during Marine Ford. He was someone I didn't really pay a lot of attention to. But when I was researching, doing this video, going through all of the different designs and everything and what they did, this guy is pretty badass, okay? So the 10th Division Commander is a guy by the name of Curiel, all right? And he actually... He looks like a Vietnam War vet, all right? Look at him. He has the vest, camo pants, and just this really no-nonsense attitude. And he has the he just goes around carrying these two giant bazookas on his back and uh, just a bunch of guns, and that's his thing. So I could see him as just, like, he, he's like, I'm ready, guys. Lock in. So he just goes into battle and just, ah, like Rambo, pretty much. That's Curiel, okay? He even faces off against Moria at one point. Moria is a one of the warlords. He has the power of the Kage Kage no Mi, this giant, imposing, onion-human kind of dude. Curiel walks right up to that dude and is just like, time to die, you onion-bodied shadow freak. Ah! You know, that's the kind of guy Curiel is. Like, so totally Sylvester Stallone Rambo. Just, like, think of him like that. Um, because of that, I'm gonna say that Curiel's 10th Division is responsible for the firearms in the crew. Alright, he's like, you wanna learn how to sharpshoot, you come to my division. Snipers, cannonball men, cannonball men, cannoneers, that's what they're called. I think they're called cannoneers. Or are they canonizers? No, canonizing is something completely different. Canonizing actually doesn't involve cannons at all. It involves, uh, I think, the Pope making you a saint. So he is a saint. The saint of guns. So yeah, it's like, yeah, like learn how to use a bazooka. That's what you do in our division, you know. So maybe he treats it a lot like boot camp. You know, you join up with my division, boy. You better know how to, you better know how to make your bed, stand up straight. Listen, when I like a drill, like a drill sergeant. So yeah, that, that's Curiel's division. I'm liking the vibe coming off of him. He actually ends up getting defeated by Akainu of all people. You just see him on the ground in front of Akainu and he's just on fire. <laughs> he's just being burned. Burned and it's just like whatever i'm sure he, he did make it he did make it all the division commanders made it out alive jozu lost an arm ace well okay eight and almost all of them ace was the one that died but i believe all the other ones managed to get out okay um 
But yeah, that that's Kirill. And you know what? You know how he probably got defeated by Akainu? We don't get to see the full interchange, but I could totally imagine how that would have worked. You know, Akainu takes out Ace, and uh, he's walking, trying to take out, um, you know, Luffy and Jinbei, and then freaking Kirill just takes out a gun and just... Pfft, and just pfft, splatters Akainu's head. And it just reforms with lava, and he's like... <laughs> He's like, who did that to me? And Curiel just shows up behind him like, I did, mofo. Da -da 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 -da! And it just unloads into Akainu and just like, da -da -da -da! <laughs> BAM! And then Akainu just reforms with magma and just sprays it. I don't have time for you piss ants. Sprays it all over Curiel and he's like, <laughs> just gets knocked out by getting set on fire. But he still makes it out alive, all right? So that's Curiel. He's, he's pretty badass. Curiel and Namer. And there's another one, too. There's one other member of the crew that I really want to see again. But, yeah, okay. So, now moving on to the 11th Division, headed up by King Du. King Du is basically He-Man. All right, I know maybe looking at him at first, you may be like, all right, this is a little weird. The, the, the page boy haircut on the super muscular body, like... Where's this going? I actually, when I'm looking at King Du, I remember, remember the episode of Dragon Ball Z Abridged when Go, it was in the first season, when Goku goes down to hell and he meets Gauz and Mez and the voices of Gauz and Mez in Abridged, they're basically like, he's like, we are a bunch of really effeminate, like German, like bodybuilders, like, we are here to pump you up. Yeah. That's the kind of voice I imagine coming out of King Du. So King Du, really muscular guy. He has these heavy iron gauntlets to fight. Just block attacks or just slam into people or just punch people with the utmost strength and prejudice. He's just like, oh yeah, I'm King Du. Maybe he was a king at some point. I don't know. Maybe he, he kind of looks like a little bit regal. I think it's just because of the page boy haircut. Maybe that's just the kind of haircut he likes. I mean, I'm not somebody to judge. I like my hair. But anyway, yeah. Uh, maybe he was royalty at one point and just decided, screw this. I'm going to go with the Whitebeard crew, right? So... Um, because of his design and what I'm thinking of how he, like, sounds and everything, um, I'm gonna say King Du's division, the 11th division, is responsible for, like, their, like, personal fitness. Like, they're the ones that, like, the, the bodybuilders of the crew that work out. It's like, if you want to get pumped up, come to King Du's Monday night, you know, workout session. We will break you. You know, that, that kind of stuff. You can picture it. You can picture it totally. King Du gets in front of all these men, is like, ah, oh, it's time time to pump some iron and he lifts up this giant dumbbell and he's like okay men let's go one two okay that's that's what i have all right so moving on king dude doesn't really have much else going for him but he does look like he man he looks like you know master of the universe okay fine sure so in that case he really should be using a sword uh, maybe that's maybe that's something he only breaks out under serious circumstances you know like well i guess he probably would have been maybe during the war it was like ace got taken out Whitebeard got taken out maybe it's time for me to reveal my ultimate power and then maybe somebody distracted. He's like, we gotta get out of here, King Du! I'm like, all right, but next time I'll show them my true power. By the power of Whitebeard! Do, 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 do. All right, so moving on to the 12th Division Commander. Ah, oh, man, who is the 12th Division Commander? I, I can't remember. Is it, is it Haruta? That is correct. Whoa. Yes! Wow, I can't wow. believe you got it. Oh, wow. What the? I don't even know who Haruta is. <laughs> Haruta. Yeah, neither did I. Neither did I. Haruta is the little... He looks like a little kid. Don't know. It might be a girl, yeah, he too. He looks He's like uh, Peter Pan. Yeah. Totally guessed at that, by the way. And in case you haven't seen it, um, that's Franky's stream when he did the One Piece Jeopardy a few days ago. It was me, Too Spooky, Roger, and uh, Franky was the one that hosted it. We had a lot of fun. The, the Jeopardy game, One Piece trivia, a lot of fun. So go, I'll put a link to that below. I'll just put it up in a card here. Go check that out. But yeah, one of the harder questions on the, the board. Actually, I think it was only a 300 uh, point question, but it was name the 12th division of Whitebeard's crew. And I'm like, Ah, crap. I know I know the 11th Division is King Du, because he's so... He, it's kind of hard to miss King Du. And I know the 13th Division, but I'm like, who is the 12th? I'm like, crap. And I just took a shot in the dark. I'm like, is it Haruta? And I was right, so yeah. And I ended up winning that contest, so cool. But anyway, yeah. Haruta is one of the more um, smaller men on the crew. And we know he's actually a guy. I know looking at him, you know, you can't tell immediately if he's a boy or a girl. But Oda actually came out later and said that there's uh, only men that fought at Marineford. 
because Whitebeard basically was like, you know, kind of under the idea, like, this is a men's war, you know, I'm not going to get women involved here. Now, you can take that whatever you will, but that was the logic, that was the reasoning. So, Oda even comes out and clarifies those nurses, those sexy, hey, hello, nurse, those sexy nurses that were on the crew, Whitebeard basically told them, you know, it was like, you need to leave, you need to leave the crew, and there was like a tearful goodbye, but it's just like, you know, this, this shit's going to get live, and I don't want you to be, you know, in danger. So that's that's the kind of thing it is. They more chivalry than anything. But yeah, Haruta, pretty small dude, just bouncing around the battlefield, wicked fast. Um, and also, he dresses in a way that's like a like a 16th century, like, British person. You know, he has, like, the frilly thing around his neck and all that stuff. So it's a pretty cool, unique design, kind of like, you know, hair that's just kind of long and stuff. Um... Haruta doesn't really do that much during the war. I don't think there's any moment where it's like Haruta is kind of get the spotlight. At, le at least Blenheim had the moment where he's like, I'm carrying away Jozu. Um, or Curiel had the moment where I'm facing down Moria. But I, I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't think Haruta really had any moment where he was up against like a uh, warlord or anything. I think he just mostly stuck to like, dealing with the riffraff. Um, what would the 12th Division be responsible for? Uh, well, let's see. What positions are we missing still? I mean, we could always... The navigation is the hardest one because I don't think there's any particular division that really screams, you know, we're the navigators, like, right out of the gate. So I said Namor's, but maybe it could be the 12th as well. We just don't know there. Um, but, uh, hey, uh, Haruta has a very unique sense of fashion, so maybe they're the ones that, they're the tailors of the crew. Hey, you got a crew of like a thousand men. You need to have, you know, someone that can sew, you know, and fix clothing and stuff. And Haruta looks very regal. So maybe that's what the 12th Division is responsible. Like, come to the Wednesday mid-afternoon session where we'll show you how to knit. I can actually knit fairly well. I won the Home Economics Award in eighth grade. You know, I was super popular. <laughs> but I did. I know how to sew. Damn straight. Anyway, um, yeah, that's Haruta. So, moving on to the 13th Division that is actually headed up by, uh, okay, so I messed this up when I was doing the, the, the Jeopardy thing. I thought the 13th Division was headed up by Fossa. I don't know why I thought of it, Fossa, but no. It's actually led it up by Water Buffalo Atmos. So he has the title of Water Buffalo, so you can imagine, pretty big dude, uh, kind of in the same vein as, uh, Jozu and Blamenko. Uh, pretty, pretty large dude. He's less muscular, but still, you know, if you get hit by him, you're going down. So, Atmos, on his own, uh, he doesn't have a devil fruit or anything. On his own, he was just kind of, like, beating down a bunch of other uh, marines and stuff. But his moment that really everybody was kind of looking at was when he was manipulated by Doflamingo. So, Doflamingo decided just to, like, oh, there's a big, large meathead. I'll take control of him. So, uh, Doflamingo uses his uh, Parasito thread to invade uh, Atmos's body and manipulate him. And he uses him to take down a bunch of his other members of his crew. And this is something that Atmos is like, I came here to save it and I'm ended up being used as a damn puppet by this scrawny flamingo on my back. So, Do, Do Flamingo, obviously, just being Do Flamingo, he's a sadistic son of a bitch. He's like, this is, ha, 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 I'm gonna have fun with this guy for a while. Do, 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 bam, 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 <laughs> He's crying. Do, 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 body slam, boom. So, he's just throwing Atmos's body around and stuff. So, yeah, um... Other than that, I think eventually he gets knocked out or Doflamingo gets bored or he gets attacked by somebody else, so his control goes away, but Atmos is not really that much of a help for the remainder of, of the war. So, yeah, unfortunately for Atmos, his, his crowning achievement was being manipulated by Doflamingo. I'm sorry, man. Um, but moving on to the 14th Division, this is another guy that has a really cool sense of fashion. 14th Division Commander Speed Jiro, or Jiru. So Speed Jiru, uh, he wears like this tunic, you know, thing. Like he kind of looks like a jouster from the medieval era. Um, and he has the sigil of the Whitebeard Pirates on the, the tunic. And he has a shield. And that's something interesting also because not a lot of other members of the Whitebeard crew. In fact, I think he's the only one that actually rocks a shield. Um, King Du has the gauntlets that can be used like that. But I think, you know, Speed Jiru is the only one that really has that. It's a jousting shield. It's like a, you know, shaped like a, like a triangle thing. And he has the, uh, the sigil of the Whitebeard crew on it there and he has a lance like a jousting lance then as his name implies he's a pretty speedy little dude so he'll run around the battlefield and he's like ha ha speed speed jousting jousting i can imagine like a bunch of marines are all stacked up or all like lined up ready to take him down and then speed jiro just bursts through and just stabs them all with his lance at once he's like ha ha 
Um, very much like Haruta, Speed Jiru is kind of on the shorter side, uh, not super muscular or bulky like Atmos or King Du or anything, so uh, maybe he teaches the rest of the crew um, how to, like, you know, fight in that kind of, you know, that, that kind of style. So similar to how, like, Namor would teach them about Fishman Karate, maybe Speed Jiro would be like, this is how you joust. You know, you always have to make sure to keep your shield here and then always, like, make sure you line up your... I, I don't know how to joust. I'm just making shit up off the top of my head. But, like, you know, angle your joust. Like, oh, I do know one thing about jousting from Game of Thrones. I do know one thing. Um, you know, when you're jousting, when you're, like, you're on horseback, and Jiro's not on horseback, but if he was, and you're going toward an opponent, make sure to angle the lance down because that way you get an assistance with like gravity so when you're you know you're charging with like the momentum of it so when you're going and if you angle your lance down and it hits your opponent's shield it's gonna it's gonna force them down more rather than if you had it straight or the worst is if you had it angled up because then it would just glance off of the shield or their armor and that wouldn't deal a you know a successful hit there so always keep the thing angled down so that would be the kind of thing maybe he would teach um oh crap i forgot to mention what the 13th division what atmos's division would be in charge of um, well, he's a pretty big guy, so, um, how about food provisions? So, like, the fourth division, Thatch's division would be in charge of actually cooking, but how about we make Atmos, the water buffalo, in charge of actually procuring the food stuff? Like, oh man, it's a sea king! Like, I got this! And he runs out and just puts that sea king in a headlock and beats it down, and then, you know, here's, here's dinner for the next week. You know, that, that, okay, we could go with that, sure. Okay, 15th Division Commander, Fossa. All right, Fossa, also really cool-looking biker dude, kind of like Blamenko, um, or not Blamenko, Blenheim, yeah, Blenheim. So, uh, Fossa has, like, this leather vest thing he wears, uh, awesome mustache, and he's always smoking a cigar, and he has a flaming sword. So, immediately, even though we don't know a lot about him, He's got a flaming sword. That, like, all right. Like, it's like, okay, you're going down the, the checklist of character traits and abilities. Like, all right, he's got a mustache. That's cool. He has a sword. Whatever. Oh, wait, is it a flaming sword or is it a lightning sword? It's a flaming sword. Okay, that gains a few points. Not as many points as if it was a lightning sword, but still, it gains you a few points. So, uh, yeah, Fossa... It's actually left ambiguous in the manga how exactly he lights his sword on fire. Uh, in the anime, we actually see him lighting it using his cigar. So we can assume either the sword itself is coated with some kind of flammable liquid or oil, and then he just, like, you know, takes out his cigar, doesn't even take it out, just, like, holds up the freaking sword up to his cigar and just whoosh, lights it up. Um, or it's made out of some sp uh, special kind of metal that just combust that lights on fire this is the one piece world we're talking about here so some kind of sword that would light on fire i'm fine with that that makes sense to me but i like to think it's maybe coated with some sort of oil there and then he can use his uh his cigar to light it and then that's how he fights so there you go um as for what his division would be in command of i don't know like cigar ruling <laughs> i don't know like i'll show you how to make explosives i mean he uses fire he doesn't really use explosives like dynamite or anything but maybe maybe he could you know have an expertise in like demolitions that's his thing all right let's let's go with that foss is the demolition kind of guy kind of looks like he would work in construction all right all right, so now moving on to the final division of the Whitebeard crew, the last but not least, certainly, because this division commander actually has an interesting spot, I think, in Oda's heart, because he focuses on him a little bit. Um, this is Izo. All right, now Izo, at first glance, looks like a geisha. Um, and I thought you said there's no women on the crew. Well, that's because uh, Izo is not actually a woman. He is a crossdresser, okay? But... He's not, a, he's not the same kind of cross-dresser as the Okama, like Mr. Tu Bonkle, or like the new Kama, like Ivankov. Um, the basis for Izo's character is taken from uh, Kabuki plays back in the day when uh, female roles were actually played by men. And so they would put on the makeup and everything for Kabuki. That's what um, Izo represents, okay? And it's actually kind of interesting because um, it seems like Oda really likes Izo because when he was asked to draw the Whitebeard commanders as children, he doesn't draw all of them as children. He draws Marco and Jozu and uh, Vista as children, which makes sense because they're the ones that get the most screen time during Marineford, but also... The fourth one he draws is Izo, of all people. You know, not, not, I mean, there's other people. Like, you could have drawn, um, 
I'm sure King Du would have had an interesting, you know, design as a child. Or, uh, you know, Namor, he, as a fishman, that would have been an interesting choice to draw him as a child. But no, he chose Jozu, Vista, Marco, and Izo, of all people. And uh, Izo is, um, he uses guns to fight. And uh, there's actually one scene where he said, I think it's only in the anime, when he's fighting against a member of the Marines who uses a sword. And he does that really cool thing where he takes out his pistols and just bang, bang. And like, like the bullets hit the sword and the sword just snaps in half. And he's like, oh, you shot my sword in half. And Izo's like, hmm, kind of a brittle blade, isn't it? Click. And uh, when we see him drawn as a child, when Oda does it in the SBS, we see him performing like a kabuki dance in like a traditional Japanese kind of theater sort of place. And where do we know in One Piece that takes a lot of references from traditional Japanese stuff? Oh man, Izo's from Wano! Maybe. Possibly. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it could be the case where Izo's homeland was Wano. And Whitebeard arrived at Wano, of course, he would arrive at Wano at some point, and Izo was there, and he's like, I think I'm gonna join up with you guys, I think I'm gonna join up with you, yeah. And also, you might consider, because he's the 16th Division Commander, maybe he was the last division to be added. Maybe there were, because 16 is kind of a weird number, I mean, I guess it is an even number, but you would say 15, you know, or 10. Then you get to 15 and 16 commanders, like, okay, so maybe Izo, maybe he was at Wano, and he's like, I'm gonna be part of your crew, and he's like, well, you're pretty strong, we'll make you a Division Commander, but there's all the Division Commanders slots are, are filled already. Like, ah, just add a new division, it's fine. Uh, with that being the case, if he really is from Wano, maybe some other members of the 16th division are from Wano. Maybe Izo's at Wano right now. Maybe after the Whitebeard Pirates, the, after the Payback War, after they got defeated, they decided to all go their separate ways. Marco went to go protect uh, Whitebeard's Island. Maybe Izo and maybe a lot of the other members were like, let's go back home. Yeah, who knows? Maybe, maybe uh, Blamenko was like, oh man, well, Pops is dead. Well, I guess I'll go back home, I guess. And, you know, and uh, maybe Izo had the same exact logic. Like, I'm going to go back home to Wano. And so we might see him there. Maybe he might bump into Robin. That would be crazy. Maybe, oh, I'm picturing it now. Uh, the, just the head cannon is going overboard. But let's say, um, you know, uh, th there's this big uh, theater presentation in Wano, right? And Orochi is going to be there. And he's going to be there to witness this show. And so it's like the, the Kabuki or the, like the Geisha, the dancers, they come out. And then you see Robin there, and she's doing her dance. It's so elegant. And then uh, the headliner appears, and it's Izo, but no one knows who he is. And he just, you know, performs his dance in front of everybody. Maybe he has different makeup on or something. They don't recognize him as a member of the Whitebeard crew. He's just doing his dance, and he gets involved in the plot. It's, 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 a, it's a long shot, but maybe. Dressed up like um, a kabuki performer. Uh, his backstory is clearly taking references from Japanese culture. And Wano is heavily based in Japanese culture, and we've already seen this kind of stuff before, so I'm okay with that. We don't know where he's at right now, so I choose to go along with my, um, my thoughts here. Now, now also keep in mind, uh, this is something else I threw out there as the entertainment factor. Uh, we're gonna go with Rakuyo, the 7th Division Commander, you know, I'm a hard rocker musician for entertainment. I like to think Izo's 16th Division does entertainment as well, but in another way in a more cultural kind of way. So as Rakuyo would be like, yeah, Tuesday nights, come and rock out with us. Or with Izo, it's like, oh, Sunday mornings, come here and I will teach you the art of kabuki. You know, in the, in the culturally rich art of dancing, you know, the, the, the proper way. So yeah, they're the dancers of the crew. Let's go with that. Sure, why not, huh? Um, yeah. So anyway, those are all the 16th Division commanders of the Whitebeard crew, um, many of which we don't know anything about, but, you know, I threw out some ideas. You could take them or leave them if you want, but I, I'm, I'm trying here. I'm throwing out ideas here. So what do you guys think about the different, uh, different Division commanders? Obviously, who's your favorite one? But do this, because... I'm sure many of you, when you say what your, who your favorite commander is, you're going to say Marco or Vista. Hell, if I'm going to pick my favorite, it's probably going to be Marco. But here's the thing. Tell me who your favorite division commander is out of the top five, because I can guarantee you most people are going to pick one out of the top five. But then also tell me who your favorite division commander is between six and 16. The, the remaining 10, the 10 that we didn't really focus on all that much. We know their names, we know their character designs and how they basically fight and all that stuff. Like, oh, I'm a fan of, uh, you know, Rakuyo, and here's my theory on how he makes the chain thing, the chain chomp. Like, this is the kind of devil fruit that chain chomp thing ate or whatever. Or like, you know what, I like, I really like Blenheim, you know? You know, that kind of stuff, you know? Let me know below. Um, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, this will be Teching 101 signing out. You better have all had stashes. Ace has a stash. Luffy has a stash. 
Genos has a stash. Even Zenyatta has a stash. There's no mistake for you, I have a stash. Tiny stash. <laughs>